This is probably the most famous painting in the history of chess. It's actually this size. Um, not very large, but the detail is incredible. It was painted 500 years ago, actually in 1508. And you can see there's a wonderful drama going on here. Where everybody's got something to say, something's going on in the room, all centered more or less around this game of chess. It's not a normal game of chess. It's got eight squares on this side and 12 squares on this side. The pieces are unusual. There's more than the regular amount of pieces that we have. There's not just a king, queen, bishop, knight, and rook. There's also a, a king's assistant. There's a, um, a queen's jester. There's a piece called a courier, which is where the, the game gets its name. This particular painting is very famous. It's been reproduced in so many, so many texts on the history of chess and the art of chess that, uh, here, I've just got a few to show you here. Just about anywhere you go looking at the history and art of chess is going to give you a very good demonstration of this particular piece. And here is Murray's History of Chess, the great classic, 900 pages of very dense material. And this shows you that famous painting in the old black and white uh, plate. And it also tells how the game was played. This interesting rendition shows you a few sketches of what the pieces look like in this painting. Um, they're not too accurate but they're interesting and it's nice that somebody was thinking about what those pieces were actually like because we take that quite a bit further. Here is the uh, reproduction of Salinas' book from 1616 from which we get the rules. Now this book was in German, an old-fashioned script. I don't read German so well, but it's good to have this source material for looking at fine points and word usage and things like that. The, the board in this particular rendition is um, compressed so that the squares are actually um, rectangles, and that is so that the board itself can be square where, while it's got 12 fields on this side against eight fields on that side. It tells here where all the pieces were set up. And it gives all of the rules with illustrations, but only of these uh, detailed um, figure type pieces. doesn't give any clue really what those pieces from the ancient um, painting represented. And um, here is a pamphlet from uh, 1990 from that particular place, and uh, it mentions that a board was given to the city of Strobeck, this town of Strobeck, um, in 1651. So obviously this game was still going on then. The best historic accounts indicate that this game existed for some 600 years, this unusual 12 by 8 form of chess. So it was a very successful, long-lived variant of chess. So this is the point. We're going to look very carefully at this particular game. The question is, are these pieces actually placed in a position where they could actually be playing a game? Could the rules of courier chess and the original configuration lead to this position? If so, that gives us clues as to what the pieces are, what each one of these represents, and, of course, what the nature of this particular game is that's being played here. What we're interested in is what are these pieces? Who's the courier? Who's the king? Who's the rook? Who's the bishop? Who's the jester? You can't necessarily tell. You can get some clues by their shapes, but you really have to look at it closely. So we took every one of these pieces out of the painting and looked at it individually, put them in a kind of an order of what pieces are similar to each other. We enlarged them based on the size of this hand in the painting. We can estimate how big these pieces are, how big the squares are, how big the pieces are, and 
So we've enlarged them uniformly so that we have a sense of how large they're actually going to be and of course a better view as we enlarge them as to what each piece looks like, at least as best you can tell from the painting. Then we just want to figure out who's who. We take each one and sort of speculate. And there's you know, two of these, one of these, um, maybe four of these, or two of these and two of these. It's hard to tell exactly just by looking what's what. This could be this. It's not exactly like it, but could be a version of these could be the same as this from a different angle this uh, is probably this this could be this which is very hard to see way over in the corner of the chessboard there okay. so we're just taking every bit of evidence we can possibly pull out of there so to really do a serious analysis we're giving each piece taken out of the the board out of the painting rather a letter just to to keep track of it, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. And we're laying them out where they occur on the board or along the side of the board. You see these pieces along the side of the board here are represented by these numbers here. So we've just taken the board and placed it like this from Black's perspective playing and said, okay, what what are each one of these letters in reality? What, what do the pieces we're indicating by these letters represent in the actual game? So, we're considering the lineup. We know that there's going to be two king, uh, one king on each side, uh, one queen on each side, one of these unusual um, jester and um, the man piece that's called the king's sage in our rendition. Uh, there's going to be two, two couriers, and then the normal pieces, two bishops, two knights, and two rooks. We're setting these pictures up to say, well, if this is this, this can be this. Could this be, could this be the king? Could this be the queen? Could this be a courier? Could this be the king's assistant, the sage? And with this particular setup, we kind of fall into a problem because um, if this were the king, then this would be the king in the black side, and it would actually be in check while black is making a different move that doesn't address the check. So things like that give us indications that this, for instance, is not the king. Well, it looks like a king a lot in our uh, modern iconography, but in the old school, in the old style Renaissance pieces, this three-tiered figure is much more likely the king. So we go and proceed with him being the king and then uh, could this be the queen and so on. Um, however, in this particular arrangement of pieces we find that the one we're calling the bishop, this guy with a round head, could not have reached uh, the square that she's putting it on if that were the case. So we basically go through this whole process. We, we look at the whole set, the set as a whole, and decide what the possible lineup could be. And almost every time we find a particular problem, there are some things that are very difficult. For instance, placing this piece. Um, if this is the bishop, it can be there. It could take one, two, three moves to get there. No other piece on the board could be the bishop. So we're deciding this has to be the bishop if this is a true game. And with that kind of information, we proceed, okay, then what could the other pieces be? What are they, both based on the way they look um, and also based on what their function is in the game itself? Finally, after all this consideration, we come up with our, our analysis of what they really probably must be. And so here, everything's been given the name of the piece that it is, C for courier, Q for queen, K for king. Uh, queens moved in the old style of queens, just one space diagonal. There's a whole um, there's a whole additional bit of information we're, we're working with is that the pieces had different moves in those days. That's what we know from uh, from this old text here. So combining all that information with what we see here, we are saying that okay, all these pieces lined up on the side of the board are the um, are these pieces here, bishop, knight. Um, Joker, Rook, etc. And all these pieces on the board are Bishop, Courier, Knight are putting this on the board. Bishop is here, Courier is here, Knight is here, etc. So this is our position we're looking at.
finally these are the pieces that are not showing and it makes sense that a few white pieces would not be showing because they would have been captured by her hand and probably covered by that massive sleeve that she has there so the whole thing makes sense Lucas van Leiden wasn't a slacker he was painting something very particular and we are not slackers either we're going to make very careful renditions of um, what he's got there. These are uh, tracings of the actual form. From those tracings, we, for one thing, we're just going to fill them in for um, to make nice pictures of them for later use. But right away, we're taking those tracings and and extrapolating to um, more defined shapes, so we can actually start the um, process of reconstructing these pieces based on. The trace based on the tracings and what we're considering the actual definition of each shape to be. We can take that tracing and then make this image and measure each part of it and start to construct piece by piece what each one of these very interesting chessmen was actually like. From this to this, this to this, this to this, this to this, etc. Once we've got those all decided, we've got we've lined them up, see how they look together and then since we're deciding that we know what each piece is we're gonna kind of um, readjust some of them a little bit so that they make a sensible set for instance if this is the king and this is the queen well the queen's just looking too big aesthetically and considering her role in the game so we just make the king a little larger the queen a little smaller just a little nudge on these to make the whole thing fall in line as a sensible set. And uh, here they are again, and then here's the whole setup without the pawns. How they all look together in the initial configuration. Really an interesting cast of characters. Much more elaborate than the set that we have with only eight squares across. Once we've got all this information, we want to make pieces that look like what was originally painted in this painting that conform to these details that we've taken out from the tracing and actually measure up to everything we've got here as we define the image more completely. So each one of these was then molded using these guidelines. And here's the material. It's sculpy. It's a modeling clay which uh, has the benefit of um, hardening in an ordinary oven. So we very carefully sculpted each one of these. Now here's the bishop for instance. Um, and uh, you can see here's the painting. It's just kind of in the shadows but its form is pretty clear. And here's how we're defining it. There it is. It's got an extra base built onto it and then another extra base glued on here to aid in the casting process. What we do is we take each one of our models that we've created and we make it into a... Um, and we put it into um, some material that becomes a mold and then from that mold resin is poured in and pieces are made. So, to see how we've done Here's the king that we came up with from that picture. Here's the queen that we've created from that picture. Um, here's her, uh, um, the king's assistant, called the Mon, or uh, we call him the sage. Here's the jester, the courier. very important and as I showed you before this guy here we also have of course the pawns oh by the way here's an article that uh, I composed for chess collectors in the national it was published in the publication it really talks very clearly about how we took them out of the shadows to find them and created them in three dimensions so, here it is, the chess set that hasn't been seen in 500 years. Um, let's see, where does this piece go? Right here. And our courier is in here somewhere, right? 
there it is set up in the position in which it was being played and um, oops where's the king the king's got to be here how oh, I put him there and you see that the woman is actually putting the king in check with a rook and he's going to be able to move uh, back here and who knows what she's going to do next probably take this pawn and put him in check again and he's really in a bad way he's got very little material she's got much more power on the board and um, he's really had it she's really focusing and he's uh, really out of it and uh, everybody's kind of giving her a little advice too but I don't think she needs too much at this point this um set. This recreation is actually um, highlighted in this new book, a uh, French book, The Odyssey of Chess. And you see they've got uh, my defined pieces there. There's the painting and uh, here's a photograph of what we have here, the recreation of the set. When we get the pieces back from the uh, caster, by the way, they're not finished. They're just kind of rough. We sand off the bottom um, put felt on there, the, then we paint them with a very nice metallic paint on this side, a dark walnut on the other side, so the whole thing comes out in as good a detail, as fine a set as we can get. For the board, this is kind of interesting, we actually took a piece of wood that was imported from Germany so that we have, we have the kind of wood that may have actually been used for this. It was probably painted by hand, so we painted that wood by hand, all the squares on it, and we finally um, had that photographically reproduced. We would had this done at a, a game board making company, so we knew they'd do a good job. Uh, this is a um, sticky back uh, printing here with a protective coat on the top. The sticky back comes off and it adheres onto a hard, thick board. So, as close as we can get to the actual original board as it probably was. Uh, one more thing to show you here is, uh, well, besides the poster, of course, this is a poster. We send this along with the set. Um, also, like to show you, as I was saying, we've gone one more step. And uh, just for the chess collector who has everything, or needs everything, this is the thing he still needs, because he hasn't got this one yet. Here they are, realized in solid bronze. This is a beautiful set, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. Solid bronze, and the pieces are just um, also solid. The dark pieces are also solid bronze, oxidized in this case. These pieces are actually refined to make them even more symmetrical and precise than we were able to do with our original uh, clay models. So the work here is just outstanding. That's the high end set. So there you have it. Pour your chest as it existed here, recreated through analysis and great care after 500 years.